Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very special welcome to you all this evening. We are delighted to host our very first live in person and driven talk of the Michaelmas term of 2022. And thank you to all of our guests from far and wide who have joined in person and via the live stream. I'm truly honored to introduce our very, very special guest, Dr. Sarah Ladipo Manika. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sarah is a British Nigerian American award winning author of novels, short stories, and essays, a citizen of the world, a cultural critic and thinker whose extraordinary contribution to the world with her beautifully written work has led Sarah and all of us who read her work on a remarkable journey of meeting both real people and fictional characters whose lives immerse us in overarching themes of self-determination, ambition, commitment to social and cultural change, and achievement against all odds. Sarah's own life as the daughter of a Nigerian father and English mother is as engrossing as anyone she has ever written about. Sarah, a very special welcome to Queen's and thank you very much for making a special effort to join us in person. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Your debut novel, Independence, has sold over 3 million copies internationally. What is literature all about to you? And what were your inspirations for this story? First of all, I want to thank you so much, Anna. It's such a joy and privilege to be here. And thank you to the master, Mohammed, and to all who I see various people here who've worked behind the scenes for this, the MCR. And it's, it's such a privilege and honor. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's come and anyone who's watching out there as well. Um, so the question about literature, what does what does literature, mm. so now I've promptly forgotten what you are. What does literature yeah. mean to you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to start by saying um, my first novel has sold over 3 million copies, but I want to start by saying that um, I failed my English literature A level. No. And um, it's it's not something I used to talk about before. It's not something I was particularly proud of. Uh, but I think I need, but I say it more these days because I feel that there's so much, you know, when people are reading out CVs and everyone's accomplishments, you don't talk about the struggles and the failures that we've had in the past. And so when I was much younger and I thought I was going to do really, really well in my A-levels, I was actually going to become famous. I, that, this, is the co this is the university that I wanted to come to. And I got a C, D and an E in my A-levels. Um, but here I am all these years later, having sold a couple of, you know, a couple of few. Three <laughs> um, yeah. And um, counting. So, so we'll start on that note. Literature, what does literature mean to me? I, you know, when I'm writing novels, when I'm writing stories, I'm trying to step into the shoes of others. I'm, as I say in the beginning of this book, I'm fascinated by people's life stories. I'm fascinated by what makes us tick and what we all have in common. At the end of the day, um, we're all human. And despite all the things that divide us or that we put in each other's way, um, there is that basic humanity that unites all of us. And so literature and stories, I think, you know, I'm not saying that stories can change the world, but um, great stories bring us together. And so I think that's where I would start with literature. 
and it starts the conversation and we can mm -hmm. all think about that yeah. absolutely yeah. you discovered that you started writing at the age of eight years old i read that hmm to, okay. To, <laughs> <laughs> I did read that. Can you describe to us your own journey of discovering what is important to you, mm. what grounds you, yeah. and how do you honor that in your life's journey? Yeah. It's interesting, you know, maybe I did start at eight, but when I think about stories, I think more about hearing stories. So I, my father is an Anglican vicar, and he, as you said, he's from Nigeria. Um, my mother's English from the north of England. Um, when my grandparents, my British grandparents were, were alive, my grandparents would talk a lot about World War II and those stories. And my um, Nigerian grandmother only spoke Yoruba, which I, I can understand a little bit, but I don't speak fluently. Um, and so I would hear her stories, I would hear her speaking, and I have vague memories when I was young. Um, so I guess where I'm going is that I've grown up in a situation, or I've, my life has been one with different sorts of stories from different cultures, and that's probably had an impact in terms of at least what I notice or what I'm eager to write about myself. So in your extraordinary new book, Between Starshine and, uh, and Clay, in your discussion with Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is an alumnus of Clare College right here in Cambridge and a great friend of our president here at Queen's, there is a very important reference uh, in your discussion with him to economic inequality along color and ethnic lines, which in turn exacerbates anti-Black racism. Now he describes this concept of structural inequality. What does he mean by that? In, in, how does he explain that to you? And, and what can we learn? You know, I think, um... So I'm, look, I'm looking into the audience and I'm like, oh, where are the economists here? You can probably do a much better <laughs> job of explaining. Um, but I want to take a few steps back and say that um, part of my inspiration for writing this book was reflecting on the times that we have gone through, which have been difficult times for all of us, wherever we are in the world, and being very cognizant of the fact that you know, we've gone through the pandemic, um, something of a racial reckoning, um, shaky democracies, and all of these things have disproportionately affected Black right. people. And so, um, and this is one of the things that Henry Louis Gates is, is talking about when he talks about structural inequality and um, systemic inequalities. And so I'm I'm kind of backing back and not necessarily talking about that specific issue, yes, but, but just generally, but saying that all of the people in this book um, speak to issues that affect us today, and they speak to the history of th these issues, how we got to where we are, and get us to think about the future as well. So all of these, all of the people that I write about have inspired me at a time when I've been, I've just been searching for answers. I've been searching for hope. I've been searching for direction. And uh, so that's why bringing these 12 people together in this book is particularly important. How did you go about choosing the 12? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, all my life I've thought in, in one way or another about the importance of art, what art means to us. I've thought about history, the importance of history, those stories that are told, those histories that are recorded, those histories that are not. And I have thought a lot about the, about progress and the sort of how we can't take progress for granted. Um, and thinking about all of those things, maybe even more in terms of what's happened 
to the world in the last few years. And so these 12 people, and the book is divided into three sections, uh, creatives, so these are artists, and then curators, historians, and then change makers. And they all, uh, and you know, many of the people overlap. They're not just, you know, some of them are artists and change makers, but they all address these things that I've been thinking about a lot. And I have also been lucky enough to meet most of these people and spend quite a bit of time with them in different settings over the years. Um, so meeting them, but also getting to know their work. So there are many people that I could have written about. And in fact, in the introductory chapter, I think I mentioned more than 50 people that could have been in this book. And many of you in this book, not in this book, in this book of a place, <laughs> um, many of you in this room could be in this book and, and you know, maybe in future iterations will be, um, or a book like this. But these, yes, I think what's particularly uh, important that I want to highlight is that these are people that I've known, many of them quite intimately, and so try to bring that to the book. So in your discussion with Anna Devere Smith, you talk about success, and she mentions Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, that if we get, that if we get where we get to of our own doing, <clears throat> we get what we deserve. But the political philosopher Jackson says, no, you get what you get. And with Anna, you speak about the door opening, the concept of the door opening and is it luck or is it God? Or what is, how do you measure success and your outcomes? How, how, did, how did you think about that with her? the concept of success because it's very pertinent to mm. to all of our young people here in the room and what we think of it ourselves as we get older mm. yeah and I think maybe that's also why I started where I started with uh, highlighting the fact that I failed my English A level um, and you know I to be honest I don't actually remember the specifics of talking about success yeah. with Anna Devere Smith, um, but it's important to bear in mind that, I don't know, there's, there's measures of, of success by society are one thing, and then one's own measures are another thing. And I think it's, I mean, just speaking personally, it's important to focus on what's important to you, not necessarily what the world tells you is important or should be a measure of your success. And it's it's hard, it's hard to stay grounded. And I think particularly, again, I don't want to generalize, but in a world of social media where you're being told, well, this is this is what you should accomplish by such and such an age. Right. Right. Um, it's hard to resist that and um, to to focus on what's important to you. Um, and also just not, you know, I guess. Here's my my um, pastor's daughter coming out in me, um, but not to get carried away with whatever success you may have now and um, the writer in me, the person that's looking at trying to embody other other people's lives and or, or trying to step into other shoes, always wants to make sure that we're listening, we're listening out for others and be grateful for what we have and what success we have, what doors have opened, but always try and open doors for others as well. Right. Um, yeah, and the way I read uh, that part mm -hmm. was in the way you discussed it with her was success, you can, is, you can have your own volition and you can mm -hmm. push through and you can try and get to the other side, but mm -hmm. ultimately the infrastructure needs to be there. The timing needs to be there. There has to be an element mm -hmm. of luck mm -hmm. and that there has to be a goodwill around you because, you know, every single one of the characters in your book and the people mm -hmm. in, that you talk mm -hmm. to, everyone has had their own challenges mm -hmm. and yet rose to where they are mm -hmm. and now are giving back mm -hmm. and, and helping. And it's a, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's a very, it's not a straight line, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, on the point of giving back, one of the things that really struck me about the, almost, uh, well, at least half of the people in this book have said some version of what they are doing is that they are planting trees under whose shade others' generations will sit. And uh, that was just something that strikes me, yeah. Well, um, in your remarkable chapter on Mrs. Harris, mm -hmm. uh, I love the part when she says, and I've quoted this to the president in the last few days, part of our journey is deciding which bridges to cross and which bridges to burn. Mm -hmm. Now, I love this. How does, one, how does one have the courage to make those decisions? Well, Willard Harris is a remarkable person. And I wanted to, you know, there are people in this book that most people will have heard of, the Nobel laureates, Wally Shoyenka, Toni yes. Morrison, Michelle Obama. There are others, people like the civil rights activist, Evan Mawariri, that certain like most Zimbabweans at least or Southern Africans will have heard of him and his courage um, as a civil rights activist. And then there's someone like Willard Harris that probably no one in this room has heard of. And I really wanted to have um, someone like her in the book because she's, you know, amazing starshine like all of the rest. She is going to be 103 years young in December and uh, I go for, I've been walking with her weekly. We go for a walk each week. Uh, she was born in 1919. I'm just going on a roll with her because I've got to give you a little bit of a, <laughs> no, a <please. laughs> Um So the year that women were given the vote and um, you know, her, she really embodies a, a century of, a century plus of history. And she's seen it all from desegregation of schools in the United States to Roe versus Wade, decriminalization of um, abortion and, and now the roll back. Right. And um, she's just someone who inspires me in so many ways, but I think to your point about which bridges to burn, which bridges to cross and which bridges to burn, one of the things that really strikes me about her is her her openness to the world and her desire to learn and to listen. And um, that is, is such a powerful message for me. Um, but also someone who she's seen it all and she's seen rollbacks, she's seen, you know, taking two, two steps forward and one step back. Um, and she still has this joie de vivre. Never too late. And that's, yeah. And she's she's always wanting to learn new things. I mean, she would love, she would love to be here. Um, and I can just already we hear could have, her. We should have brought her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned in, um, in the book, you know, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the actual title says that one is never done and that there is always room for personal growth. Um, with the implication that one can always do better. So, Sarah, what is next in your stage of becoming? And how do we all think about our next steps? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm thinking about Willard as well. And again, she's just an example of that. She's still, she's still learning. She's still, I think I say this, yeah. she's still growing. Um, oh, I feel, I mean, there's so many next steps for me. There's so much so much more that I have to learn that's never going to end. Um, in terms of practically what's next for me, um, I'm, I'm really excited to come and talk about this book in part because it also gives me an opportunity to meet um, new generations, younger generations and all the, the starshine that you will, you will bring to the world. Um, I so I'm I'm excited about every event that I do around this book and I am in the middle of a new novel so Amazing. that's on a personal note something that I'm doing um yeah so um 
aspects of Michelle Obama's life mirror your own uh, and your journey. You were you were born in Nigeria, Michelle on the south south side of Chicago. Yet you're very similar in what you think about what's important. And Michelle says, failure is a feeling. Failure is a feeling long before it is an actual result. Mm. Now, the universal challenges of women and young girls continue to be faith that young women and girls continue to face in the world. Um, as Michelle discussed with you, is the challenge of squaring who you are from where you came from. Mm -hmm. So in all of our journeys, how do we how how do we become present and understand who we are without letting where we come from intrude? And how do we stay grounded in, in that? The first thing that comes to my mind in terms of how do we stay grounded is who do we surround ourselves by with? Um, I think the older I get, the more I think that's really important. Uh, but I just have to go back to Michelle Obama. I love the fact that you say that there's some kind of similarities, but <laughs> girl, she <laughs> is like on a different on a different plane. And I have to, I don't know if I mentioned this in the, the essay that I wrote about her, but um, you know, I I'd seen Michelle, like we've we've all seen her on TV and and you know, and then I and then I saw her and this is in the essay, and then I saw her at the white in the White House and um you know from afar and then i got to to meet her in a, in a more intimate setting on holiday with her family and some of the friends and again i can't recall if i actually said this i don't think i did actually but uh i was introduced to barack uh, at that bowling event yes. first and it was like you know he's yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like hi, Brock, but it was. Like, <laughs> I, I, I it, it was, you know, nice to meet him, and yeah. and then I, I hadn't seen Michelle, and I was talking to Elizabeth Alexander, um, uh, close friends of theirs, and I was so engrossed in talking to her. She'd just written a memoir that was amazing, and I didn't see Michelle, and then I was introduced to Michelle, and I'm it's the first time where I really sort of lost I didn't I just started gushing and she has such incredible presence so she's even more stunning and amazing in real life than in all the glamorous pictures she's very yeah, um, very big energy yeah and energy. so um I I yeah so yes so and so when you said that there's some similarities I'm like whoa I don't, I don't think so <laughs> I beg to differ but... <laughs> Sarah I've gotten to know you very well so you discussed with her and and what she does when she talks is she urges women that we women should prioritize ourselves mm -hmm. more than we might ordinarily do now to learn how to put ourselves essentially in our own calendars first rather than allowing everyone else to get into our calendars ahead of us. Now, have, have you learned how to do that, Sarah? Because I have not learned how to do that. <laughs> how does one learn that for all, all of us here, really? Yeah. Um, um, I don't think I have learned it very successfully. And I think as a writer, um, you know, there are times when you really need to just immerse yourself, at least for me, really immerse yourself in your work and not not worry too much about you know staying in touch with everyone else and um right it it's hard it but then stressful. but then at the same time there's real life I mean the, like, this isn't exactly what Michelle is talking about but you know if you're looking after family or you're looking after older people you know you can't you can't completely abandon abandon everyone else um but I think going back to Michelle's point it's 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 a very valid one that you know we've got to be able to we can all do better in terms of prioritizing and also I, I think you know the older one gets I don't know if you you found this Anna but it, it really becomes clear that life is 
is is not very long right. um Absolutely. and so that sort of also helps to concentrate the mind right and, yeah. and to decide what's important mm -hmm. and, and what you value mm -hmm. yeah. right. so senator cory booker mm. in his the discussion with you was very moving in the book i know he's a great friend of yours from oxford so sarah was at oxford even though she didn't come to Cambridge <laughs> no but I was at Oxford just because my <laughs> brother was there and my boyfriend was there so I know I, I can't even claim that either but sure I can pretend <laughs> I spent a lot of time at Oxford right. and 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 he describes his own father's struggle and his own quick rise from Oxford then to Yale and then two degrees from Stanford now we've all had um some time with Corey uh, over the years and his dad said to him life ain't about the degrees you get it's about the service you give prove yourself mm -hmm. so and that's his dad mm -hmm. who who really struggled mm -hmm. and was very unimpressed with his own son after mm -hmm. he had all these mm -hmm. wonderful accolades as a senator now and he talks mm -hmm. about staying grounded, staying in touch with people, doing the right thing. He ran for president, he's very young. Um, I, I understand he went, he was vegetarian, now he's vegan, keeps pushing. The, so how do we, how do you see him in what he's doing out there? Um, well, I think what you highlighted, his father saying, you know, it's not about the degrees, right. um, it, it's, it's more than that kind of goes back I think to what you were saying about success um and yeah I mean Corey I think I mentioned this in the chapter one of the things that I find so inspiring about him is he really he really walks the talk and you know he he lives in um and a not a uh, in a in the neighborhood that's not very wealthy I mean right. he lives with he just he literally stays grounded in every in every way and um he's poured a lot of effort and energy into thinking about the criminal justice system and many other issues that are really important um and so yes I think perhaps it's his father his his mother who've helped him instill in him that uh, need to stay grounded but also and I think I mentioned this in the chapter one of the things that I love about uh, Corey is his emphasis on joy and uh, not forgetting to uh, celebrate and that's kind of a, a theme for the book as well in terms of the title um, you know he was he he didn't want anyone to steal his joy with Kitanji Brown yeah. and that's also a powerful message as well that whatever we face trials and tribulations there's also time to celebrate and to be joyful when you met when you were with tony morrison mm. what was your most sort of memorable minute or or what the energy that you were left that was a very important occasion for you how would you describe it well, I think that was the literary highlight of my life, for sure. Wow. Um, and you'll get a sense by reading the essay that I write about her and the conversation that we had. She, she's very theatrical and very generous. So I went to speak with her with Mario Kaiser, a journalist, and we went to talk to her about her the last novel that she she wrote or at least that has been published thus far and I think you know what struck me was her theatricalness her sense of humor and her generosity I think we were supposed to be there for an hour a couple hours later we were we were still there and you were in her home I think you met yeah. her son yeah. yeah her son dropped by and you know, she she sort of jokingly said, what did you bring me? Did you bring me a sandwich? <laughs> and he bought books instead, which is really kind of the nourishment that she needed for the next whatever she was writing. And then her sister called 
and when she picked up the phone her voice just went really kind of sweet and you know she was very very close to her sister so we got like all these little different windows mm -hmm. into her life in a way and her family and you know she had a housekeeper there and a friend a, a friend from the village neighborhood dropped by it was easter saturday with a big bunch of flowers and you know he offered to bring her food and she wanted this and that and her housekeeper was saying you shouldn't eat this you shouldn't eat that and she's like you know mm -hmm. drop you know f-bombs here <laughs> and like, you know just yeah so just a Amazing. just a and I, I i think that's the other thing you know going back to joy and celebration that people's sense of humor and laughter is something that runs through this book and runs through the conversations which is is so important in life to be able to laugh right. and enjoy each other and have good times and light times well and, and i look at all of you know our guests in the room our mcr community here and our sort of jcr community and our fellowship and in be, Cambridge is an incredible institution and it's it also gets heavy in terms of its intellectual capacity and the seriousness of what we all think about and what we do and 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 yet those years go very quickly and so it's important that we all think about how can we enjoy it? How can we have fun while we're being serious? How, how can we have fun while we're doing really well? So may I ask, what would you say to your younger self today? I'd say more, have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, don't take yourself so seriously. I'd say travel if you're able to, if you have the means or if you know people and just I, I think just moving I mean I'm lucky in that my I've moved with my family but I think what has really enriched me and the way that I see the world and think about the world has been um, being able to move and travel um, but I want to go back to the heaviness I mean just I was advocating joy and laughter and that's right. very important I'd say laugh more um, but I want to go back to the heaviness of sort of intellectual scholarship and so forth in Cambridge and reference Henry Louis Gates Jr., who, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot and also in putting this book together is what he says about the last battle of anti-Black racism is around intellectual inquiry. And I think this is another reason why I was so eager to put this book together because it's looking at creatives, it's looking at historians, it's looking at change makers. And th these, are, these are great scholars in different shapes and sizes, uh, in different ways. They've all been pioneers in different ways. And we don't talk enough about people of color who have made uh, people like Henry Louis Gates Jr., who's just phenomenal in terms of what he has done, what he's created, the biggest you know, center for research around African American, African studies. Um, and it's important that we recognize this and that we we celebrate this and we give it something of a platform. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Sarah, on this important uh, note, I would like to turn uh, this discussion over to my co-host, Sneha Batista, who will facilitate the Q&A and uh, we've had pre-submitted questions. And of course, if anybody um, has a thought and would like to offer some questions too, um, say hello, over to you. So we have, again, a person pre-submitted question. I'll read them out to you. Um, in your book, between Starshine and Play, you take us on this 12 3 rate journey through, one, through a wonderful set of interviews. In this journey, we get to learn life stories of some of the greatest and most influential people of the time, right from their upbringing, their vision, and how they came to do what they do best. You talk about history, circumstance, background, but also how they recognize themselves and their dignity in these current times. I'm curious to know what inspired you to write this book and tell their stories, and why write in a descriptive yet very observant manner 
of storytelling? Well, I, thank you to who asked that question. I think I've answered it partly in terms of talking about thinking about art and history and, and the fragility of progress. But maybe what I will do is I'll pivot a little bit and I'll talk about the title um, because I think that also speaks to, it, it underscores what's important about this particular group. Um, so the title Between Starshine and Clay is a line and a half taken from the great poet Lucille Clifton. And she, the poem itself is entitled, Won't You Celebrate With Me? And I think I have it memorized, so it's, it's short, and I'm just going to share it with you because it's a good way of explaining why I think this title is an embodiment. It, it, it really stands for the people in this book. So it, it's entitled, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. So for me, that speaks to people who have really faced <clears throat> um, barriers of all sorts, difficulties, and yet they've been able to overcome. And there is reason to celebrate that. And it's not just them, it's not just, I'm not just focusing on them, but it's a collective celebration of what peoples have gone through and have triumphed. And maybe in a way I'm trying to speak to these times as well and add some hope that in many ways we, we haven't been through these exact historical circumstances before, but the world has seen turbulent times before and there's hope and there's certainly reason to celebrate. When you talk about color, when you talk about culture and people, mm -hmm. um, I think it's my personal opinion that we come in so many colors and we make the, uh, the world a beautiful place with all the colors that we bring into it. But in your book, you also talk about your own experiences about how race has been to you. Mm -hmm. um, you quote in your book, which you say, um, you've been seen as Oyimbo in Nigeria, African in England, Arab in France, colored and served in Africa, and black in America. We'd like to know your views on racial categorization and why as a society, we're so focused on giving everything a fixed status or category. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Um... You know, it's these social constructs and the ways that we like to divide each other and um, categorize people in different colors and some make some better than the others. Um, and so, I mean, you just highlighted the way that I'm seen in different parts of the world and it just sort of shows the arbitrariness of the way that we think about different colors. It's interesting, I'm mean, going back to Henry Louis Gates Jr. Uh, one of the books that I just got literally yesterday that I'm so excited to read is a book that's co-edited by him and it's called um, Who's Black and Why? And it's a series of essays that were published in response to a prompt a contest that was put out, I think in 1741, by the Bordeaux Royal Society of Science. Um, and it, it was a contest inviting people to think about uh, who is black and why. And I'm, I, again, I've just literally started reading the book, but it's an interesting reminder of at that time when millions of people were being transported across the world uh, enslaved, the 
underpinnings, even, you know, in the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment era was enlightening in some sense, but the reverse is another in terms of really establishing thinking and thoughts about the so-called inferiority uh, or less than human of Black people. So I'm, I'm going off on a tangent uh, a little bit, but I'm saying two things, once again, coming back to one of the people in this book, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and the incredible scholarship that he does in so many areas, and digging up these really fascinating texts that help explain how we got to where we where we are today, um, and what the roots of this all are. So yes, I hope I got the title of that book correct, but um, I'm sure it's kind of close. Yeah, that's yeah. Just to tie on to that. Um, in the say you living in two different places mm -hmm. growing up, did you find that I assume you could probably would have embraced every place and their culture as your own? But did you find it difficult when we went through the difficult times during the pandemic and before that people of color felt they needed to talk about color, whereas people feel like maybe they don't need to like th there's this conflict or dilemma like should I talk should I not talk like and if I do talk why do I need to talk because it's at the end of the day we're all human mm -hmm. we come from one race which is humanity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I'm not sure if this is quite an answer to what you're saying but what it's making me think of is James Baldwin who I reference in my introductory chapter and I with a very reverent nod to him, the introductory chapter is entitled Notes of a Native Daughter and not to his Notes of a Native Son. And Baldwin, and I think I spoke to someone who's uh, looked at uh, at least Giovanni's room in her uh, PhD studies. Baldwin has always been a guide for me or someone that I've looked up to, and I really hold strongly to many things that he's, he's said, but in particular, the statement that, and this is a paraphrase, that it's important to remain committed to the struggle against injustices and, in, and inequities, while also keeping one's heart free of hatred and despair. So, at, you know, Baldwin for me is a great example of someone who's really holds seemingly kind of contradictory or or difficult thoughts to kind of have side by side but that are absolutely essential and so that for me has has always been and continues to be a guide just a few more questions before i ask the that's an impossible yeah. question to answer. <laughs> I, you know, Toni Morrison inspires me as a writer. Willard Harris inspires me as just in life. Um, I, I know I'm just going to talk about Margaret Busby because we haven't talked about her uh, just for a minute. Um, so Margaret Busby was the youngest and the first Black British woman publisher in England. And um, she published New Daughters of Africa and Daughters of Africa, two groundbreaking anthologies featuring hundreds of uh, Black women voices from around the world and across the centuries. And that her books uh, have been a real inspiration for me. And I feel, and the reason I'm mentioning her is she is, she's here, she's based in England, she's yeah, based in England, English Ghanaian. And she's someone who I still feel there's not been enough attention. People, I, you know, I, I wrote an essay on her, but I think people should be writing books on her. I mean, there's, you know, so she's, and again, she's one of these people that, that says, I plant trees under whose shade other generations will flourish. And uh, that's great, but I, I, I would love to see people like her just receiving a little bit more attention because she's just done, she's done incredible work and she's inspired so many of us coming up. So in answer to your question, I have no favorites, but you can just <laughs> uh, get me to talk about any one of them and I, I'll go on and on. <laughs> just to 
mixture of um, half queens who pride ourselves on being a multicultural, diverse community. And recently, our first Riz Mohammed finally launched the Alexander Summer Scholarship mm -hmm. in honor of Alexander Summer, mm -hmm. which was a great initiative and it gave full fledged scholarships to quite a few students recently who would not be able to get the opportunity. So mm -hmm. they finally get to fulfill their dream mm -hmm. via Cambridge and through mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> I always find questions of advice hard because I don't really feel I have advice to give people. Um, but I celebrate what you have just said. That's fantastic. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I think I, let me just go back to Willard Harris. It's funny actually, because she, I, I gave her the piece that I wrote on her before it was published, just to make sure that I hadn't made any factual errors. And I had made one. I, I, she has brandy in her coffee every morning, and I, <laughs> and I got, I got the brandy brand wrong. Oh wow! So um, <laughs> thankfully, she, she helped correct that. Um, uh, but now with the brandy, I've, I've forgotten what I was, where I was headed with all of this. Um, but no, I, I, yeah, I think what I was going to say is she has various sayings that she, that, that I mention in the chapter. And um, she said to me, she said, well, maybe you could put these sayings in bold because maybe it will help people. Uh, so in terms of advice, something I think about a lot is one of her sayings, which is, don't take your pain in advance. And I, you know, my train was canceled today and then another one was canceled and I'm like, ah! and then I'm like, don't take your pain in advance. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe that's the piece of advice that I'll leave right. you and it's not mine, it's Willard's. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we'd just like to open the floor up to the audience. If anyone has any questions here, if you'd like to ask. Please feel free, absolutely. Yeah, please go ahead. So, uh, I'm Lindsay and I'm from Macro Finance uh, as that. Um, so, my question is you, you know, you mentioned you basically felt, you know, in your uh, A level exam about literature, and then you are such, you know, successful in selling the book today. It's such a good example of, you know, how people got sort of the setbacks and then gain um, advantage in the future. So, my question is, how do you really overcome this challenge? And when did you discover your, you know, self-awareness that you really want to do this in your work right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, just as you're saying this again, the, the book that sold several million, it's, it's, this happened to me when I was in my 40s. And it's, again, you know, you, you, just, you just, life is weird. You don't know what will happen. Um, and it doesn't always have to happen when you're in your twenties. So, <laughs> um, but in terms of your question was again in terms of what how did you overcome? Yeah, how, I think I'd go back to what I said about the importance of having a good circle of friends and a community. Um, you know, someone that's just so special to me is Willard Harris. And I really treasure the, the hour or so that we walk together. And she helps to keep me grounded. Um, so I think finding those people who lift you up, uh, who don't necessarily flatter you. I mean, sometimes flattering is good, yeah. Um, but people who love you enough to uh, want to see you grow and encourage you and can give you critical feedback when it's necessary. I think that's really, really important and finding communities. And I think that's, I mean, I, again, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I think that's one of the things during COVID when you know, we're still in COVID sort of, even though we kind of maybe think we're not in COVID, but just the, the, 
people in their own like little um, silos and not having communities, whatever the community is for you, whether it's a religious community or or a sports group or community, community is important. I think we can do better as a world right. to foster greater community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have anyone else that would like to? Marina, please go ahead. Um, we actually have a large audience from uh, the YouTube uh, live stream as well. And if it would be possible to read one uh, question. From Absolutely. The... Thank you. So a message um, and a question from Shukri. Um, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, as we have just finished celebrating Black uh, History Month, and you yourself mentioned Marina's recognition for Black pioneers. What can we do to shed even more light on these black scholars in our day to day lives? I think first of all, realize that black scholars and black voices, these are these are human voices and it it behooves all of us. Our knowledge as a human race is going to be much deeper, much better if we pay attention to everyone's voices. Um, and so, yeah, this is so exciting. This is November 1st, we're out of Black History Month, <laughs> but we're still talking about this book. Um, Margaret Busby talks, I she refers jokingly to um, Black History Month as Black Employment Month, um, but let's let's make it a, a year round, a year round thing. Thank you very Thanks very much, Marina. Um, so this is an opportune moment to announce that our Angevin Talks inaugural speaker, Dr. Dambisa Moyo, who is a good friend of both Sarah's and mine, is now Baroness Moyo of Luxford. Um, having received a life peerage from the British government and now will be in the House of Lords. So uh, please join me in a round of applause. What a good <laughs> And to end our um, evening's proceedings, I would like to ask Marina, who is the president of MCR, uh, to please join me with Sneha to present a very small token of our appreciation to Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much um, oh, for a very you. memorable evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. This is, wow, this is not a very small token. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Lovely. On behalf of everyone from yes. the MCR. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Sarah, thank, thank you, you very much for a memorable evening and for leaving us with so much to think about and to act on. Um, good night to everyone and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Please feel free to take your time. Thank you. 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 The conversations from the past and the past. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I take my part to quite quite a bit? Thank you so much. Yeah, I asked